this series, I think um, it's four weeks of sort of looking outward and looking at different nations and different parts of the world. And we're primarily talking about India, and I think you can hear about Ukraine and South Africa and Sierra Leone. And I, and I guess it's sort of going to be really interesting hearing about those places. And if you get, if they grab you and grab your heart, that's fantastic. But actually, I guess what I really want is that, like, God puts the nation for you on your heart, you know. And, and really, that's what I'm hoping, like, we can inspire you today. You'll hear about India, but actually, it's not about India. It's about what what good God puts on God puts on your heart. And I was sort of thinking, well, I want to sort of open with a question, really. What, what do you think was the greatest thing that Jesus taught? Like, the one thing, maybe, sort of like, I mean, I was thinking about this, you know, it's like, well, maybe the Lord's Prayer, you know, it's like, is that, you know, or maybe something in the Sermon on the, on, on the Mount, you know, there was quite, quite a lot in the Sermon on the Mount, or maybe it was the story of, um, about the prodigal son, you know, and how, what the nature of the father. Um, or maybe I was reading this morning about um, the centurion and the faith and authority. Uh, but Jesus, when he decided to actually leave the earth, the last thing that he told the disciples was to go and make more disciples of all nations. And I just think it's really, really interesting, like, of all the things that Jesus could have referred back to or, or talked about in that last moment that he was with the disciples, that actually what he chose to say was go and make disciples of all nations. And we don't tend to spend a lot of time talking about nations, but actually when you start sort of looking into the Bible, God says an awful lot about nations. He's really interested in, in the nations. And this you know, the Great Commission, we know it very well, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I just think it's amazing, of all the things that Jesus could have chosen to have said just before he ascended into heaven, it was about nations, is what he what he talked about, and that got me thinking even more. Well, why, 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 why would you focus on that as your last thing that you say, the thing that you want the disciples to remember? Go and make disciples of the nations. And actually, there's a clue a few chapters back in Matthew as well, because Jesus says that the gospel of the kingdom will pre will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So for Jesus to come back, actually the word has got to go to every nation. So you could almost <laughs> say that actually in Jesus saying, go to all nations, so if you want me to come back, you, the, sooner, the sooner you go to all nations, the sooner I'll be back and be, be with you again in, in, in physical in physical, in physical form. Um, so, which again, I think, says something of the heart of Jesus. You know, obviously he's with us all the time through the Holy Spirit, but he wants to be with us in person. And, and actually what needs to happen is that the gospel needs to go to all, all nations. And we get that picture of revelation, don't we, um, of what it's going to be, what it's going to be like. Um, and we get this picture here of this great multitude. It says, no one could count um, from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne, before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And, th and that's that, just that God's heart for people, for all all different like ethnic groups and try you know the whole multitude of people he's desperate to see everyone everyone have that opportunity to be there before the Lamb of God worshiping and praising and understanding what Jesus has has done um, 
And, and so we need to capture a like a heart for the nations in the same way God has got that heart for the nations, that, that, that desire. And um, yeah, we just tend to be really parochial, don't we? And we, we tend to uh, think of you know much not much beyond our own own horizons. But actually, yeah. for those of you who travel and have had the opportunity, you know, you, you realise how diverse the world is and how um, like amazing and unpredictable and crazy and colourful and smelly and beautiful and you know that's what the world's like and that's. Those are the sort of people, um, you know, and God bless everyone of all of those people, whether they're, you know, smelly or or or, or not. Really. Um, and certainly India, um, you know, I wish, you know, I wish I could sort of um, bottle a little bit of what India is like because it is. If you go there, it's a bit of a marmite sort of place. If you've ever been there, you either absolutely fall in love with it or you absolutely hate it, because it's a very noisy place, it's a very smelly place, but it's a very beautiful place um, uh, as well. And hopefully today we're going to uh, give you a little bit of a, a flavour of what India is, is, is like. But before we get into that, Cara's going to say a little bit about our story. So, um, just quickly, kind of how God brought us to where we're at right now. So, we got married in 1995, and when we got married, Colin knew that, that God had sort of said to him that he was going to be sent overseas, because he had a word about being like Barnabas, being sent out from the church of Antioch. And we didn't really know what that meant and what that looked like, and then we actually thought we were going to get married and we were going to go off somewhere, and we were going to end up in another country. And just that didn't happen at all. Um, and um, so we ended up in Bristol and we ended up in a church actually that said it had a vision to be like the church of Antioch so that's why we were there sending people out and, um, and it um, had connections with other countries this, this particular church but one of the things that, that really spoke to us about how God called us was we were doing a, a leadership training about and about five years after we got married and somebody had a prophetic word for us that um, said that we would be like these guys, you can't really see it very well, but you know the story where the four, well you don't know whether it was four people, but friends carried a paralysed man to Jesus and lowered him down through the roof. And we had a prophetic word from this lady that said in the context of mission, overseas mission, Colin and I would be like two of these people carrying somebody on the mat and that we needed to find another two people to be on the other corners of the mat to fulfill what God had for us. So that was a very clear, very specific word. Um, and about a year after we had that prophetic word, we went to the Indi India for the first time. It was 2001 when we went, first went to India. And um, when you're sort of if you're, I don't know if any of you have thought about whether you've got a call to sort of go somewhere else or, but it's quite a process, Hattie will tell you, it's quite a process of, 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 of hearing God over time and then sort of testing it a little bit and maybe putting your toe in the water. And we went to India with this church that we were part of and when we were there we just knew that that's where we should be. We absolutely, God really confirmed it to us very clearly while we were out there. Somebody was, was giving a talk about calling, and they said, sometimes you just know what your calling is because you know, this is what I was made for. This is what I, this is what, who I was made to be. And that's the sense we had when we were there. We had, yes, this is what we are made for. And it was the first time we met Joseph and Sarah, who some of you will have seen on the Zoom calls that we had during lockdown. They're a couple who live in Almora in the Himalayas. I'll have to say a little bit more about them later. Oh yeah, this was the first time we went to India. Oh, you can't really see it that well, but we look so youthful and fresh faced, believe me. That was oh, well, like changed much. Yeah, years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 20 years ago. So yeah, go on. So 
And we thought we'd just then give you a, a bit of some facts and figures about um, uh, uh, India. <coughs> and to give you a bit of a scale of like India is about the size of Western Europe. So actually, when you talk about India, it's a bit like saying, oh, going to Europe. And actually, you know, when we talk about having an Indian takeaway, you know, it would be like, say, have a European takeaway. It, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a thing that we sort of made up, which completely sort of masks the fact that it's a huge nation, uh, you know, with lots of diversity, loads and loads of languages, lots and lots of um, different uh, uh, people, people groups. But, but in terms of sort of uh, religion, um, as most of you know, it is a predominantly Hindu um, uh, nation. About eighty percent of the people there would be um, uh, hin Hindus. Um, there's a large Muslim uh, community as well, which people don't tend to associate um, with India. And when when you think um, the population of India is about one point three billion people. 13% um, Muslim, that's a lot of Muslims. It's got one of the most largest Muslim populations in the world, actually, um, live uh, in India. Um, and as it says there, by 2050, um, it, it is projected to be actually the nation with the most Muslims of any country in, in, in the world. And then Christianity is about 5%. Um, there are about 70 million Christians uh, in in India. Um, there are an awful lot of unreached uh, people groups in India. As I said earlier, there's lots of different languages, uh, and uh, the vast majority of the different people groups over there are 2,300 different people groups, and about 90% of those are still unreached um, as of as of today. Um, and actually, even though uh, the, the, over, the sort of average is 5%, there's this sort of northern belt that we've highlighted on the map there where um, it, it's pre very small numbers of, of, of Christians, uh, less, than, less than 1%. And that's the area that Joseph and Sarah are. So, so uh, our Mora, foothills of the Himalayas, is sort of up, up here. Um, and Delhi is sort of here. Um, Delhi would be in this area um, as, as well. Um, and there is very much a sort of north-south divide in terms of uh, uh, Christians. So you've got um, Delhi, uh, uh, yeah. Varanasi, and Calcutta in the north. Those in those areas where the you know probably less than one percent of the population would be would be Christian. There's a much more Christians in the, in, in the south, so places like Chennai and Mumbai would be up as much as 15% would be, would be Christian, and then way over in the east as well, there's quite a large concentration of, of, of Christians as, as well. Um, as a society, um, India is urbanising, so there's, there's, a, there's a, a real drift from rural areas into... Um, urban areas. Uh, some of the biggest cities on the planet are in um, uh, uh, in uh, India. But what goes with that, as people come out of rural areas, is you're seeing a big growth in people who are living in the slums. And probably 70 million people. Uh, I think that's an underestimate, but probably 70 million people live um, in in, in so the slums. Population of the UK. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, that'd be about the population of the UK. Um, and I don't know how clear that is, not very clear, um, but that's a photo of the slum in Delhi that we've been that we've, we've been to. That slum is actually not too bad, um, you know, as slums as slums uh, slums go. So, you know, massive poverty, huge extremes. Um, you know, the most expensive cars I've ever seen are in Delhi. Um, you know, driven. Driving along the street, you'll see, you know, the supercar showroom uh, with people begging outside, you know, on absolute uh, poverty. So the extremes are uh, enormous. And some of the issues we just wanted to, to just talk about uh, uh, in uh, India. So Hindu nationalism is really um, uh, on the rise. The government there is a 
very much Hindu nationalist um, government, uh, very much trying to suppress other um, uh, point, points of view. Talked about the massive divide between uh, rich, and, rich and poor. I mean, the extremes are, are absolutely um, um, extraordinary. Um, should give a bit of a shout out to Operation World, a lot of these stats from, from there, and they have a whole thing where you can pray for different nations, and actually it's been India this week, uh, uh, coincidentally. But this is a stat that we got from Operation, Operation World, actually. Over 40% of the world's blind people live in India, and the vast majority of the people who are blind, it's actually with curable, you know, cure, it's curable. Um, but a very, very large number of, of, of blind people. And again, you can see that when, when you travel around. Um, big issues around gender inequalities there. Um, uh, women are not, not valued. It has some of the highest uh, sexual violence rates uh, in, in the world. Um, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about um, the charity we're involved with, the Bridge Trust. But one of the things we've done with them is build toilets and obviously there's an obvious sanitation benefit that but one of the big benefits is that it gives a safe place for women to go and go to the toilet because otherwise what they do is go out into the fields away from the village where they're vulnerable and get um, attacked and, and raped um, so actually building uh, toilets as well as the obvious sanitation benefits actually is a way of trying to support and deal with sexual, sexual violence um, persecution um, is um, common in India. If you were to list every country in the world uh, with the country that has the most persecution at the top and the country with the least persecution at the bottom, the top country would be Afghanistan. Second is probably North Korea. India comes about 10 out of 200 nations in the world. Uh, some of the people we've met out there have been flogged and, and beaten. But persecution isn't just about physical. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what our friends out there have is more like what I would describe harassment. So people camping outside your house, playing loud music 24 hours a day. Um, uh, a lot of the charity, what one individual we'll talk about later, you know, charitable work, getting classed as a business and then being taken to court because they're not um, paying um, you know, the right <coughs> electricity bill. You know, just finding reasons to just harass and make life mm. difficult for, 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 for Christians. And then the other thing that's very um, uh, uh, well known about India is the caste system. In theory, it doesn't exist, it's illegal, but in practice um, it has um, a very big uh, influence uh, and actually the Daleks who are the sort of lowest car class a lot of, a lot of uh, them have become um, uh, Christians but actually this, the, um, the Brahmins who are the top class very 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 few of the wealthy in India have become uh, Christians and, and actually it would be, you know, be really good to pray, pray, pray about that just realised they didn't change the, pope, the pictures on that last slide, so we had rockets and all sorts of things that weren't at all relevant to India. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about the rocket, why that to do with this? Yeah. yeah, again, I can't really see this, which is a real shame, but hey. So I just wanted to, um, because, you know, we're talking, talking about that word we had about the four corners of the map, one of the things that's really been impressed on us is the need for partnership. You know, that God works through relationships. So whatever, what he has, he has drummed that into us time and time again. So he has, he has asked us particularly to find relationships. And that's what, that's what that word was about, was about finding relationships with other people to connect with them in order to bring them to Jesus. And so one of the things that we have done over the last 20 years or so times we visited India is developed relationships with some of the people that that um, we've met out there and there's a particular church network um, called Victory Churches of India that we've got a connection with 
And um, I'm just trying to skip forward a minute because I always wanted to see what's going on. Okay. The guy on this slide that you can't see is a guy called um, Naveen and his wife Manju. And he's a pastor and he works in the slums in Delhi. So he's part of this wider network of churches and he's been given responsibility particularly for some of the slum projects in Delhi. So he oversees a slum school where children can come obviously and they get fed and it might be the only food that they get um, from, the, from the school. And he also um, oversees a group of health workers and these are ladies that have been recruited from the slums and they've become Christians through the church. And um, they go around the slums as a kind of health visitor. Okay, it's not an official um, medical role, but they're uh, a point of contact and they do sort of basic first aid and hygiene and health and that kind of thing. And it's proved really valuable in the slums to have this network of of, of people anyway. Naveen, a bit more about that possibly afterwards, but, but Naveen oversees them and I just wanted to mention him because he has been subject to quite a bit of persecution. Um, he's had the police camping outside his house um, and keeping an eye on him. He's had, um, as Colin mentioned, this situation with the court. Um, where they accused him of stealing electricity, essentially, and he had to go to court about it. And so it's this continual drip feed of stuff that he's, that he's had to deal with, and that's all the authorities sort of opposing them deliberately because they're Christians. So uh, that's a picture, again, you can't see of Naveen in the slums distributing food. And this is just quickly an over a slide um, just an overview of the situation with the Victory Churches. These guys here are the Jay and Lizzie, Pastor Jay and Lizzie, are the, they, they established this network of churches in India. And they were actually, Jay became a Christian in, in the 60s, and he's got, a, he's got a very visionary heart, he's an evangelist. He came from Tamil Nadu here, and he and his wife felt called by God to go to the north. Because as we said before, the north is quite relatively... Um, Unchristian. So um, they were called by God to go to the north to plant a church. They travelled with a, a small baby all the way up to Agra, which is where the Taj is, the Taj Mahal. And they established a church in Agra. And now they're based in Delhi and they oversee a network of churches across the whole of India. And their vision is to have a church in every single state in the, in the country. I can't, I don't know how they're doing on that. It's too I don't know how they're doing on that score, but, but um, <coughs> there are certainly a lot of churches all over <coughs> India, and Almore is where our friends Joseph and Sarah come from. Um, there's a picture of <coughs> Slum School. I'm just going to um, just talk a little bit. Shall I come in and talk a little bit about the bridge stuff now? So during the pandemic, um, I should just say actually that um, what happened to Colin and I is that we... we visited India several times with this church that I mentioned, and um, which was Bristol Christian Fellowship. And that church ended up over a series of things of, of closing. Um, but in order to maintain the work they did overseas, they set up a charity called the Bridge Trust, which um, now does the work in India and Zambia that that, that, that church used to do. And as it happens, Colin and I are going to be employed by them as of September. Um, Colin finished his job on Friday, so um, <laughs> we are just about to embark on a whole new adventure, and Colin and I are going to be employed by this charity as of September. So it's a big change for us. Um, but it means that we'll be overseeing this work in India, and we've also got to, got to get to know the work in Zambia, which we don't know so well. But just a little bit about what the charity does. So, again, it's, it's very much in connection with other people. So we, the charity itself doesn't... It raises money to support other people to do it. So we don't, we don't actually do the work ourselves. We support the church in India and the church in Zambia to do their poverty relief work. 
And also, it's just generally about supporting the church and supporting, supporting church leaders. Um, so one of the things that they've done is they did a feeding program during COVID. So they went into the slums and they, you know, they gave food. How many thousands of meals was it? 500,000. Yeah, 500,000 meals they gave out during COVID in the slums. Um, these are the health workers that I mentioned earlier that work in the slums. A group of amazing women, very... Um, Sometimes women in India, because of the, the gender equalities that we mentioned earlier, sometimes they can be a bit shy and retiring. Mm -hmm. These women are not. Okay, these are a feisty group of women <laughs> that really, you know, stand their ground. They're great. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, that's one of the health workers in the slum, just tending to somebody's injury. And in that context, like a cut could be fatal, <laughs> you know, so um, we've been told that in the area that these women work, the mortality rate has absolutely dropped, oh. just because of doing very, very basic first aid, basically, but it's, it's life-saving it's life stuff, stuff that we sort of completely take, take for granted is actually, you know, life-saving in that sort of context. Mm -hmm. I said we, a part of our role is to support the church as well. So when we go there, we quite often do training and teaching and things. So this, and you can't see, that's you can't see Cara, it. actually. Yeah. And, and she's, she's wearing a different outfit there. But again, what she's wearing today is a very typical outfit for women um, in, in, in India. But she's got a much more colourful pink one on. But it's a shame you can't see it. And she's also wearing, you can just make it out here. They always get the garlands, so that's one of the amazing you things when you go to India. You want yeah. to get a big flower garden, garland put around you. Or, or now, actually, they do these ones made of sort of paper and beads, and they're amazing, actually. <laughs> and this is us with our friends Joseph and Sarah from the Himalayas. They are, again, part of this church network, and Joseph oversees a region in the north by the Himalaya. So he's one of the senior um, leaders in the, in the church network. And they are a couple that we've got to know particularly well, who are actually coming to England in October for three weeks. So I'm hoping that they can come along here and I think they might do a bit of, might do a talk or something well, while they're here. And so it'd be, it'd be a great opportunity to meet them. Um, and this is our last slide, just showing the Bridge Trust um, details. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you want to say? Yeah, so, so this is just our opportunity to do a little bit of plug. So obviously, um, you know, it would be great if people could connect in. And we're on Facebook, so if you type in the Bridge Trust Limited, the Limited is very important. There's quite a lot of Bridge Trusts out there, but it's the Limited that sort of distinguishes us. But it would be great if people did want to connect and uh, see what the, the charities do. But as I said earlier, you know, we've been talking about India, we've tried to share, and give a tiny little bit of flavour of what it's like. We can't really give it, give it justice, but it's what I was saying at the, at, at the beginning. In one sense, my heart isn't that, that you catch, capture a passion for India, it's that you get that, capture that passion for the, for the nations. Mm. Uh, God, you know, just pray that God has put you know, uh, um, somewhere on your heart. And that, that might be India, it might be you know, somewhere in Africa, it might be Montpellier. But, you know, it's just having that heart for the nations and the heart for uh, what God wants to do in, 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 in these places. And, but also, it's just... As Cara was saying, it's about relationships and connecting, and connecting with people, and um, there's just a richness that just comes from meeting up uh, people, um, Christians or otherwise, uh, from other parts of, of the world. It's just so, so enriching and so challenging. I find every time I go to India, I spend as much time thinking about what I'm like in the UK as I am thinking about what I'm doing um, in India because mm. it just shifts your perspective and it makes you realise how much we do including in the church is because I'm British not because I'm Christian <laughs> um, and it's actually it really distills down you know what is what is the gospel really about and you, you really get a perspective in, in, in that way and I can't I can't recommend 
you know, having that, that global um, view uh, more, really, because that's God's heart. You know, God's, God's got that, that global, global view. Mm. Um, and I don't know about you, but I want my heart to be like God's heart, so um, that's probably where we should end it.